It wasn't long after the invention of television that the holiday special came into existence, a commercial ritual just waiting for a conveyance. Every year for decades now, shows have asked us to reflect on what the holidays mean and what we can do to live that spirit for at least one day out of the year. Think of the worst holiday special you've ever seen. Now imagine that there is something even worse than that, and that it's part of one of the most popular, most valuable pop culture franchises that has ever existed. No, not Jurassic Park. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of the Star Wars holiday special. Star Wars Holiday Special was a televised variety show set in the Star Wars universe featuring members of the cast of the 1977 film and prominent entertainers of the 60s and 70s. It was roughly 90 minutes long and was broadcast only once on stations around the world on Friday, November 17, 1978. 13 million people in the United States tuned in and were suddenly silenced by nine uninterrupted minutes of unsubtitled Wookiees in domestic situations grunting and growling at each other. Merry Kashyyykmas. On the surface, the Star Wars Holiday Special is about Han Solo and Chewbacca in the Millennium Falcon running the gauntlet of Imperial forces, attempting to get Chewbacca home in time for a holiday called Life Day. The direct, dramatic, narrative parts of that story are broken up over the show, separated by a variety of musical, dance, comedy, and animated segments. Those segments range from legit important character developments that fill in some of the time after the destruction of the Death Star in A New Hope and the beginning of The Empire Strikes Back, to moments so unfathomably bad that you will self-defensively forget you ever saw them because your mind has to protect your fragile psyche from the trauma it has experienced. Through the narrative, we get to see Chewbacca's home on Kashyyyk and meet his family, his wife Mala, his dad Itchy, and his son Lumpy. See, Chewbacca's nickname is Chewie, so, so it makes sense that other Wookiees would have adjective-based nicknames as well, and not for nothing, but that is the funniest thing about the show. We learn that Chewbacca's family has a relatively modern, mundane home, complete with a conventional kitchen, a hollow chest board, toys, pots, and pans, and an illicit device in their entertainment center that allows them to communicate directly with members of the Rebellion like Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, C-3PO, and R2-D2. As Chewbacca's family is getting ready for Life Day, the Empire continues their efforts to find members of the Rebellion. This brings the reality of the space war into the living room as Imperial agents intimidate the family members, trash Lumpy's bedroom, and generally act the way you would expect authoritarian jerks to act. The time between plot points is filled with a cavalcade of stars that would have impressed the parents of the young Star Wars fans back in 1978. Diane Carroll, Jefferson Starship, B. Arthur, Art Carney, Harvey Korman, and an early Cirque du Soleil type performance. The one segment that would have excited kids was an animated short featuring the first appearance of Boba Fett. But the real promise of the holiday special was to return to the world of Star Wars, to once again be in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon, to battle TIE fighters, to find out what Luke, Leia, and R2 were up to, to go back to the cantina at Mos Eisley. All of that without having to go back to the theater, hoping to recreate even just a little taste of the Star Wars experience in your own living room, on your own TV, something very rare in the days before widespread VCR ownership and decades before the internet. They say no one sets out to create something bad, and that was the case with the Star Wars Holiday Special. The intent was benign, keep Star Wars alive in the public consciousness, juice the merch sales, and reassure the people with the money that Star Wars was still worth the investment while Empire Strikes Back was in production and beginning to exceed its anticipated budget. Star Wars was coming back to theaters for the 1978 holiday season. Creator George Lucas was under increasing pressure to make sure that Star Wars continued as a franchise instead of seeing a drop off in returns like most sequels experience. He still had a lot more story he wanted to tell and either way, the loans needed to get paid back. A TV show tie-in that would put the franchise back in the spotlight, introduce some new toys at a time when people were trapped indoors in front of their TVs during the holidays was theoretically a can't-lose situation. Lucas wasn't crazy about the idea, but understood the marketing implications. And not for nothing, but why not throw a bone to all of his merchandising partners helping keep his independent studio solvent? Accounts differ as to whose idea it really was. Ultimately, Lucasfilm and the television network CBS agreed to develop the special, and Lucas himself provided the general story and made sure that the production had access to the props they would need. He helped make sure that the biggest names of the franchise were involved, whether they liked it or not. 
The first director was David Akamba, a proven live event documentarian. He also had the distinction of attending USC film school with George Lucas, even though they didn't actually know each other at the time. The executive producers Gary Smith and Dwight Hemian also came from the live music world, having worked on concerts for Elvis, Sammy Davis Jr., and Sandy Duncan. They were some of the best, and because of that, had very busy schedules, which necessitated bringing in additional producers Joe Layton and husband and wife duo Ken and Mitzi Welch, who had worked on The Carol Burnett Show. Of course, they would be using as much of the John Williams score as they could cram into the show, but they would need Ian Fraser to fill in the gaps. Bob Mackie, who was and is one of the most important fashion designers, was hired to create some of the costumes. Everything they needed to make an incredible Star Wars musical variety show was in place, and that's what they realized was exactly not what they should have been doing. Because even on its worst day, even at its most use in big doo-doo this time, Star Wars was still something that George Lucas took very seriously, and this wasn't that. But Lucas wasn't involved. His other commitments gave him no choice but to give the team his blessing to go and execute. To do the best right thing that they could without him. And the best right thing this team could make was a musical comedy variety show. A TV format that had already fallen out of public interest long before the name Star Wars was attached to it. The script went through multiple rewrites, each time trying to compensate for mistakes made in the previous, each version trying to build a musical comedy around space apes that communicate in grunts and growls. San Dan, a human trader who lives on Kashyyyk, loosely based on early concepts for Lando Calrissian, was introduced specifically to work around the communication issue without making the viewer read subtitles for 90 minutes, to be the interpreter between the Wookiees and the audience, even though he himself did not speak Wookiees. Shut up, I know it's Shri Wook. As a standalone dramatic show, it might have worked. As a standalone musical comedy variety show, it might have worked. Together, even during the production, they knew it wasn't working, but they were too far in to turn back. David Akamba was feeling the pressure as well. He'd never worked on a TV show with a multiple camera setup. One of the biggest differences between making a TV show and making a feature film, he was used to capturing the energy of a live event. From Kenner's Star Wars collection comes the Stormtrooper, the Sand People, and all 20 action figures, including new Hammerhead, Snaggletooth, and more, each sold separately. And now, Boba Fett, Star Wars villain, with his laser rifle. Boba Fett is not yet available in stores, but you can get him free, with four proofs of purchase from any Star Wars action figures. Details on specially marked packs at participating stores. Offer ends May 31st. Star Wars action figures sold separately from Kenner. After shooting the cantina scene with B. Arthur and the Jefferson Starship musical segment, Akamba decided to leave. He didn't feel like he was doing what the producers wanted, and they were getting frustrated with his process. On top of that, there was, like, no money left in the budget for the other 80% of the show. Production shut down while a new director could be compelled to take up the job. Steve Binder received the script on a Friday and was asked to be in the studio on Monday. It was ambitious when it had a budget. It was even more ambitious, if not impossible, without it. But Binder took the job. Binder didn't even meet with Lucas. As he put it, he was just there to be a fireman and get the thing done. A big responsibility, but also freeing since the situation could not get worse than it was. Any degree of completion would be considered a success for him in the context of a production that had completely stopped. Producer Gary Kurtz had to finesse the inclusion of the marquee talent. For whatever the special was, it would be nothing without Han, Luke, and Leia. In the 70s, it was very rare for movie stars to do television. It was considered a step backwards for your career. To convince three of the hottest young stars in Hollywood, it was going to take some effort. He was not above begging. Harrison Ford didn't want to do it at all. Carrie Fisher wanted to do a scene where she could sing, hoping to parlay that into more musical performances. Mark Hamill wouldn't do it unless he was guaranteed that he wouldn't have to sing. Not only did Bender still have to shoot all of the primary action with Han, Luke, Leia, R2, and 3PO, he had to shoot everything that took place at the Wookiee household. That set had to be partially disassembled to expedite shooting and accommodate the multi-camera setup and the crew that needed to be involved to properly capture the action. Not only had the monetary budget been exhausted, but the time budget was underestimated. Shooting in the summer in Los Angeles meant that every suit actor had to take more breaks than expected so they could cool down and get oxygen. All of these pressures, all of these mounting complications hung over the production, threatening to break it at any moment. The final scene, the Life Day ceremony, was shot in a giant empty airplane hangar. The lighting was done with candles purchased from shops all over town. The costumes, far from Bob Mackie portfolio pieces, were just red fabric draped over the actors, many of whom were wearing rubber Don Post Chewbacca masks that any fan could have purchased to wear for Halloween. 
When the dust of shooting had finally settled, Bender handed off the uncut film to the producers. His schedule only allowed him the time to shoot it, not edit it. The final cut was in their hands, none of whom were editors. For all its obvious and undebatable flaws, there was some good that came out of the Star Wars Holiday Special. In 1976, the first director, David Acamba, made George Lucas aware of an animated short called A Cosmic Christmas, produced by Canadian animation studio Nelvana. Lucas was inspired by their animation style and wanted to include them in the holiday special. Clive Smith came up with the story concept, which he and Lucas refined into the first appearance of Boba Fett entitled The Faithful Wookiee. It is the first ever Star Wars cartoon, and Lucas had hoped that it might actually move Fox to purchase a full series if it performed well. Hard to say if fans would have been interested as it was lost in the quagmire of the rest of the special. Boba Fett was based on the unused Joe Johnson Super Stormtrooper designs with some artistic license taken since the final look of the character had not been established. This accounts for any inconsistencies in the coloring and details of his armor, his characterization, and his weapons. The Faithful Wookiee is visually inspired by the work of Jean Giraud, aka Mobius, at Lucas's request. Harrison Ford, Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, and Anthony Daniels reprise their roles as Han, Luke, Leia, and 3PO. Don Franks is the first person to give voice to the fearsome bounty hunter. Boba Fett's actual costume design was shown off in his first public appearance at the San Anselmo County Fair Parade in San Anselmo, California, just two months before the Star Wars Holiday Special aired. At that point, it was too late to change his look for the animated short. Nelvana would ultimately stick to the color choices from the Holiday Special when they returned to create the Droids animated series for Lucasfilm in 1985. Despite the fact that the Holiday Special was, for all intents and purposes, a way to reinvigorate merchandise sales, there were no toys specifically released for it. Kenner did create some very early prototypes of Chewbacca's family members kitbashed from existing Chewbacca figures. But those were never put into production. Boba Fett was on his way as a mail-in promo ahead of The Empire Strikes Back, but even that was only tangentially relative to the Holiday Special. That said, enough familiar characters appear in the show that you may have already owned a character who looks like Greedo but isn't, a character who looks like Walrus Man but isn't, a character that looks like Snaggletooth but isn't, a character that looks like Hammerhead but isn't. The only official merch released were some promotional stills, a press kit with a holiday special poster, a 1979 Random House children's book entitled The Wookiee Storybook, which featured characters from the show, and of course the single Light the Sky on Fire by Jefferson Starship as seen on the Star Wars Holiday Special. <laughs> Not for nothing, but the initial ratings weren't that bad. It took the number two spot right behind Love Boat in the eight to nine hour and number two behind part two of the miniseries Pearl in the nine to 10 slot. Actually, that is bad. This is Star Wars, the bar is higher. History has not been kind to the Star Wars holiday special. Critics have given it the thumbs down going on five decades now. Fans don't like it either. It's one of the few things that nearly the entire fan base can agree on. It's rumored that Lucas once said that if he had the time and a sledgehammer, he would, quote, track down every copy of that show and smash it, end quote. But the source of that quote has never been verified. Like official copies of the special itself, that quote has only been passed from person to person. Officially, Lucas has been much more benign in his responses. The franchise not only survived the special, but thrived afterward. He was able to tell a lot more of his story and basically just resigned himself to the fact that there's nothing he can do about it now. The Star Wars Holiday Special was only broadcast once. The VCR had only started to hit homes a few years prior. If you weren't one of the people who thought to record it, if you weren't one of the people who knew someone who thought to record it, you would have never been able to see it. For years, it was a myth, an urban legend. Images in fan magazines that made you scratch your head and wonder where a photo of B. Arthur and the Cantina Band was from. It wasn't until those kids from the 70s and 80s started to revisit their childhoods in the 90s that the special came back to the public consciousness. Home recordings were shared and duplicated. They could be purchased at conventions. It was backroom deal type stuff. Black market gold. A gatekeeper's dream of a true fandom test. In 1987, Lucas speculated that it might get released on videotape, but officially it wasn't. The internet changed all that. YouTube changed all of that. You can, as soon as this video is over, click over and watch the special in its entirety here on YouTube. The ease of accessibility has transcended it from black market legend to rite of passage. The question is no longer, have you seen it? The question is, how much do you actually want to see? The Boba Fett animated segment, The Faithful Wookiee, was officially included on the 2011 Star Wars The Complete Saga Blu-ray set, making it the only piece of the special that has ever been released. Ken and Mitzi Welch claim that Lucas considered including the entire special on that set, but opted not to, which was just fine with them. It wasn't what they intended to make. It wasn't what the fans wanted to see. It wasn't even up to the standard of television variety programming, and certainly wasn't up to the standard set by the film itself. That said.
Is it canon? In the 40 plus years since the single broadcast, nearly every element, nearly every location and character from the special has been introduced through a subsequent Star Wars story in some manner. Some movie, cartoon, comic book, video game, board game, some action figure, some novel that retcons the names, added Chicha Chuck and Lumpawara Rump as the full names of Chewbacca's dad and son. It's not funny. <laughs> Blasted right through them. <laughs> I don't even know how to pronounce it if you take it slow. How is that supposed to be pronounced? It's just a bunch of letters. <laughs> and nearly all of that was wiped away by Disney when they purchased Lucasfilm from George Lucas in 2012 for $2.2 billion and $1.85 billion in stocks. They reset the official canon to only recognize what was in the six existing feature films. The rest was legends. But that was several movies and a lot of comics, cartoons, action figures, and video games ago. Several elements, including Life Day itself, have once again been rolled back into official canon. The entire 2020 LEGO Star Wars Holiday Special not only name checks the Star Wars Holiday Special, but it too centers around Life Day. That one is probably not canon, but the point is people are talking about this stuff again, and it's not just to make fun of it. So no, the Star Wars Holiday Special is not canon. Not yet. But the galaxy is certainly large enough that it is absolutely plausible that there is a band somewhere out there in that galaxy long ago that looks and sounds like Jefferson Airplane and that Lumpa Warump is a fan. In 2008, Star Wars Holiday Special co-writer Leonard Ripp said, quote, I think in a bigger sense, it's nice to know that Star Wars does have feet of clay. Ultimately, when all is said and done, it's an outer space movie. It's not sacred. And what has amused me the most is that somehow people think this special discredits the image of this sacred text, end quote. Star Wars has been around for over 40 years now. There is so much material related to this franchise in existence. At this point, it would take you years to read, play, watch all of it. And here's the thing. Most fans, whether hardcore or casual, have been forced to create their own headcanon about what is and is not part of their Star Wars story. Very few fans like all of it. The Star Wars Holiday Special marked a lot of firsts for the franchise. One that should not be overlooked is that it was the first time fans were forced to confront the idea that they may not like every story told within the Star Wars universe. It asked them to consider what being a fan of this franchise might mean. Maybe you like the books, maybe you like the games, maybe you like Clone Wars, maybe you only like the Gendi Tartakovsky Clone Wars. Maybe you like Rogue One, maybe you like Attack of the Clones, maybe you like the Freemaker Adventures. The Star Wars Holiday Special is exactly like all of that stuff and deserves to be included or excluded with all of it as you decide for your own personal Star Wars experience, because it may not be canon, but it is Star Wars. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you haven't heard, we started a second channel called Toy Galaxy 2. That's T-O-O. -O. Head over there and subscribe for stuff we don't post here. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy or become a YouTube channel member. Please share this video and let us know in the comments down below if you've ever seen the Star Wars Holiday Special. And if so, what was your favorite part? For me, it's Harrison Ford. That guy is an absolute pro and brings a gravitas to that thing that almost legitimizes it. You know, he doesn't want to be there, but I believe that hug he gives Chewbacca just before he leaves is real. And that's acting. Cut.